Okay, it is exactly 7.30. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Fahim. I'm the pharmacist prescriber, contractor, founder of Medlearn, voted pharmacist of the year 2019. Pleasure to be here. And basically today what we're talking about is getting you folks to start to think about non-medical prescribing in the right way. Now, I, I want to mention that again, it's, and it's worth repeating, is to get you folks to think about non-medical prescribing in the right way. I'm just going to quickly check this question because someone's put a question on there. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I'm just going to, uh, Thorin, Thorin has raised hand. I'm not sure why Thorin has raised hand, but let's, first of all, let's get some rules set. If for some reason the stream goes or something weird and wonderful was to happen, just stay patient, I will log back on, we should be fine. If you have an absolutely burning question and you really can't wait, then put it on there. But I will, I will answer at the end for you. Otherwise what ends up happening is that I'm having to work back and forth, look at the questions that you have, and then it kind of just delays things. And I, I intend this to be 45 to an hour to finish off pretty much everything and give you a chance to ask any questions. So we're gonna be spending an hour together. Plan it very straightforward. I want you all by the end of today to be very clear on how you get on this journey to become a non-medical prescriber slash independent pharmacist. So some jargons that you should be aware of is non-medical prescribing and independent prescribing is the same thing. Okay, that's the same thing. I'm just gonna quickly, before I now never do this again, I will check once more. Okay, Thorin said, sorry, that's it. No more checking, folks. I'm not checking that anymore. So what I'd like at the end of this is for all of you lot to be able to know exactly how you get on that ladder, how you become a non-medical prescriber and do it successfully. I don't want you folks to be spending a year of your time doing your independent prescribing and you finish at the end and you're sat there thinking, how do I utilize this skill? because there are so many practitioners, so many clinicians who, have, who are non-medical prescribers slash independent pharmacists, prescribers is the same thing, who can essentially write prescriptions, they can't use it. They've, they've, they've invested their one year worth of training, six months, whatever you wanna call it, and they can't use it. I don't want you folks to be in that boat. So we're gonna go through everything from how you become a non-medical prescriber, I'm gonna use that word instead of independent prescribing, how you find a DMP, what university to go to, what the pitfalls are, what things you need to consider, what mistakes I've made so you don't have to, and how we can support you. If there was anything else that wasn't covered in there, write it on the questions and I will go through it with you. So, moving on. First of all, I want you to understand a bit of theory. I need you to understand this very basic concept of how non-medical prescribing or independent prescribing actually came about. And essentially what happened was that it was in 1986 where we had this, this uh, Cumberledge report, which basically established that nurses were doing the diagnosis, but doctors were prescribing. So think about it, right? You've got nurses who are doing this diagnosis. So imagine I'm there, I've seen a patient, this patient has shortness of breath. And I say, you know what? This patient might have a potential pulmonary embolism, a clot, Dr. Thorin or Dr. Eugenio, could you please write a prescription for a Pixaban? That's what was happening. Because the nurses were diagnosing, they were on the field, doctors were prescribing. The problem with this was who is legally responsible? And that was the problem. You had the nurse doing the diagnosis, you had the doctor prescribing, so who's legally responsible if something was to go wrong? So they said, look, we need to scrap this. We need to find out you know, if this is happening on the field, how can we make it safe? And that's what it was in 1992 when nurses were first allowed to prescribe. Now, I want you to think about something here. I want you to think about how, or more importantly, what non-medical prescribing or independent prescribing was actually invented for. It was invented for those practitioners who were already diagnosing and treating and had the relevant experience in a field, you would then go to university and get a qualification and then you would prescribe. It was never intended to teach you how to prescribe. The course has never been intended to do that. This is why so much, 
pharmacists or nurses get their non-medical prescribing qualification and they sat there thinking, I can't use it. I don't know how to use it. How would I use it? Because the six month course, the university courses were never designed to say, okay, Fahim, you're a pharmacist. You don't know how to measure pulse. You don't understand the patient journey. You don't know how to take a history, undertake a physical examination. You don't know how to manage a range of conditions of the clinical diagnosis. It wasn't meant for that. It was meant for Fahim, who was working hands-on, maybe in a GP practice or in a hospital, had experience in that field and said, okay, I'm seeing these patients, I'm treating these patients. The only thing I'm lacking is writing that script. Now, I'd like to ask you all a question and I'm gonna put this on the chat. So I'm being a bit naughty and going against what I said. I'd like to ask all of you, does that make sense to you? You know, Badrul, Chris, Eugenio, Leono, Kushal, Nelly, does this all make sense to you? Why that's important to understand? Can one of you write it on the chat? Why is it important for you to understand? Thank you, Chris, that the whole kind of framework behind this independent prescribing and non-medical prescribing was intended for clinicians who were already working autonomously but needed the legal paperwork. It was never intended for like what I did is a pharmacist who thought, okay, I want to be a non-medical prescriber because it's a huge opportunity. I'm going to do the course and I'm going to gain all this experience. It was never meant to be for that. And that's where I fell foul is when I did this. And at the end of my qualification, I sat there thinking, right, now what happens? I was supposed to have all this superhuman energy that was supposed to come in in six months and I could stop doing what a doctor was doing. It's not that straightforward. So keep that at the back of your mind is how do we, how do we rectify that mistake? How do we rectify that? So 1997, we went a bit further. They said, okay, you know what? Nurses are comfortable with this. Let's allow them to prescribe a bit more. So we added more conditions to their list. Then we moved on to 2002 and we said, you know what? Pharmacists should also be allowed to prescribe. So we had initially supplementary prescribing. And that's where similar to, you know, you have a clinical manage management plan, similar to like a PGD, I guess, essentially set up for a pharmacist, whereby they're allowed to prescribe based on those clinical, you know, those guidelines, those exclusion, inclusion criteria. Then they went one step further. I said, one second, why don't we let pharmacists to prescribe independently as well? Because these studies and the evidence shows that independent prescribers are safe, equally effective as doctors within their speciality. Remember, you're not becoming a generalist, so let's allow that to happen. And 2005, up until now, you know, I've, you know, I myself have taken that responsibility to start to demonstrate what can be done. Pharmacists, for various reasons, haven't actually demonstrated what the power of non-medical prescribing is for your business, for your revenue, for patients, huge benefits. And there's many reasons for that, which we'll discuss. So, right, check slide. Do you all understand that slide? Do you all have any questions regarding that slide? The, the quicker you answer, the quicker we can kind of go on. Anybody got any questions or anything I've mentioned there that just, just kind of went, ooh. Okay, fine, Bahadur, brilliant. Okay, so moving on then, I will say that Bahadur is taking, you know, responsibility for everyone. Why bother with non-medical prescribing? Why should you, as a clinician, invest in yourself to go down the road of non-medical prescribing? That's the question that I want to demonstrate, make that easy for you now. Okay, first of all, there's a shortage of doctors and shortage of nurses, okay? There's a problem there. If you can solve that problem, you will do well financially, you will do well on an emotional level, you will do well on a spiritual level, whatever, because you're solving a problem, you're helping people. That is the biggest reason why I decided to undertake that. And tell me what happens when you solve a problem. Normally when you solve a problem, there's an exchange in value, okay? So uh, Chris or Bahadur, as you individuals are very active, Tell me what happens when you start to solve a problem. What does tend to follow naturally if there's, an, if there's an exchange of value? If I solve this problem for the NHS or I solve this problem locally, where I start to take burden off the GPs, what will I get in return most likely? What can I potentially set up? Think about it. Pharmacist-led clinic, basically you're gonna have an exchange of new services, there's a financial reward. This is very straightforward. There's no 
point hiding the, behind the bush about it. Ultimately, if you, if you were to invest in yourself, that it will always be, uh, sorry, can't see everyone else's chat. Oh, really? That's weird. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure why that might be, but, but, but I don't know why you can't. Oh, my bad. Sorry. I, I'm not sure why you're not allowed to see everybody else's. But it does say to all panelists, it oh, doesn't matter. So when you're really having a good time, aren't you today? You're kind of throwing me off my, off my, uh, off my mojo. Uh, anyway, nonetheless, uh, where was my, well, I lost my train of thought. Right, yeah. Okay, so what were we talking about? We were talking about uh, the benefits. Okay. So, shortage of doctors, shortage of nurses. The NHS has a problem. You want to solve that problem you will always benefit financially, you will always be able to help patients. Essentially, that's what my mindset was. Because when I went into non-medical prescribing, we had financial problems, we were so close to going to bankruptcy, I'd recently gone through a divorce, everything was just, everything was happening, everything was up in the air. And I thought, you know what, everything I've worked hard for, you know, it's, uh, everything I've, I've changed it to, everything I've worked hard for, it's just been pulled under my feet. You know, working day and night, working so hard, this can't be right. Ultimately, I have realized that I want to have enough money to be comfortable. And then you find out that in order to be comfortable, you need to be rich. So <laughs> it's a catch-22. The reality is that you need to have, you need to have finances, you need to have money, because that's what, you know, money is important. It's a tool that you can distribute, you can help people. There's so much you can do with it. Money is Money is not the be all and end all, but it is important because of the way things are. Okay, so I said, how can I use this or this make money to benefit my business? You know, invest in people like, you know, I've got my colleague there who's working, invest in staff and so forth. So essentially I thought, okay, right. Shortage of nurses, shortage of doctors. Nurses have been prescribing for years. Why can't a pharmacist do it? I know nurses prescribing minor illnesses. I know nurses prescribe for a range of conditions. What is stopping a pharmacist from prescribing? And then I thought to myself, why hasn't anybody else thought of this? Can't just be that I'm super smart or I'm Einstein. This is non-medical prescribing has been around since 2005. Why hasn't anybody else thought of this? So I thought, you know what? Maybe I'm just smart. And that's why nobody else is bothered thinking about it, which is stupid because that's not true. So I didn't think about it too much. I was concerned. I did wonder that why have people struggled? And there's all these pharmacists who are prescribers at the time. There's a survey that was done in 2012, there was a survey done in 2016 by the GPHC, and it said that pharmacists lack clinical skills, there's not a support network, and that's why they can't use their prescribing. I thought, ditch that, that can't be the case. I'll go do it. So my first struggle was finding a non a, a a dmp this is a question that you all have how do i find a dmp i did exactly what some of you have done is i started to email surgeries i started to knock on surgery doors i had some conversations no interest not interested i spent probably two years doing that and then i thought why is no one interested why don't they want to teach me now I want you lot to answer this question. If you're going to come to me and, and you want me to teach you something, what would I like in return? And please don't say money. Please don't say money. It's, it's not money. It's more to it. There's a, it's more deeper than that. It's not money. Tell me, Thorin. Tell me, uh, uh, Hilba. Someone tell me. I want something. What do I want? Okay, so time is one. So time would be one. Okay, so time is one. So you want my time. What else do you want from me? If you were going to pitch to me and you said, Fahim, teach me how to diagnose and treat a range of conditions. Forget money. What are you going to offer me that I would want to teach you other than money? What could you give me? So you've got some return on your effort by helping you in your practice. Ideas for bettering surgery. Well done. Work uh, ethic. Grow the business. Good. Give me some more ideas. Come on, folks. Let's start thinking. Because this is what's stopping you from getting your DMP. This is, this is exactly what's stopping you. Because when you're, some of you folks who are approaching these doctors, these surgeries, you're not approaching them in the mindset that what are they getting in return? Help them out on a regular basis. Okay, so you can, so time, a lot of it's time. Look, right. If you want something from me, I want something in return. The only time that you got a free lunch is when you were in your mother's womb. 
After that, folks, there's nothing like a free lunch. Uh, Ahad, when did you last get a free lunch? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there's no such thing as a free lunch. He's working here in return. He's getting paid in return. He's doing what I asked him to do. We have that mutual understanding. He has a responsibility. I have a responsibility. He's not my slave. He's not a servant, but there's a, there's a mutual exchange. Yes, we respect him. We love him. We care for him. But ultimately, there is an exchange. When you go to a GP practice, they're going to say to you, okay, Mr. Thorin, you want us to teach you. We don't want the money. What are you going to do for us? What can you give us in return? Because my doctor is going to spend 90 hours with you irrespective of whatever you thought of it, that they're not teaching me much or it's a waste of time, what are you going to give me in return? So I said, okay, what can I give you in return? The first thing I did was, as I started to find out how the practice works, I realized that they're a business as well. Just because they also have an NHS contract, like we have an NHS contract, you know, just like a dentist has an NHS contract, they have an NHS contract. So I started to read up. I started to read a book. Okay, let me in this. Not that I'm saying you have to do this, but I'm trying to explain to you what I did. I went back to the, how the surgeries run from the cough points all the way down to their uh, emis, down to their patients, down to their journey. How does a surgery run? Where are the pain points? Where are they struggling with? What was their recent uh, CQC report? Write that down. What was their recent CQC report? So I started researching and I said, okay, I know what your problem is. This is where you're lacking. This is where I can support you. I said, first of all, let's have a look at your staff numbers. What if I was to spend time in return teaching some of your staff members how to properly manage patients and make an algorithm for you guys so they can actually refer appropriately. Not every call goes to the doctor. They got interested. I said, also, you, are, you, have, a, you have a dispensing practice, don't you? Because they're dispensing. I said, why don't I make your pharmacy more profitable? All of a sudden, they're interested. I said, what about your cough points? I can help you with your cough points. How about if I started to work on hypertension? All of a sudden they were interested. I also explained to them, how about if I was to start helping you with your document? In those 90 hours, I'll also start helping you reconciling your document. So I did my due diligence. I didn't just walk in and say, oh, because it's a God-given right, help me. It doesn't work like that, folks. There's no God-given right. You have to give something in return. I didn't want to give you money because I felt my time is worth more than money. Okay, so I said, I'm not going to pay you. I'm going to give you something in return that you don't have a choice. And I went to about six, seven surgeries. All of them, all of a sudden, were interested. Yeah, we're interested. We want this. Oh, you can do this? I said, yeah, you repeat management. Let's get them all, you know, let's get RARDs. You have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have belief in yourself. Then you can go to people and exchange that value. Don't ever feel undermined. Don't ever feel that, okay, they're doctors or they're nurses. I'm off that level. Folks, anyone can get there. Time and practice. Right. Does anybody have any questions regarding how they're going to approach DMP now? Do you have any questions how? You might have a question about COVID. COVID has made things a bit difficult. COVID has made things a bit difficult, not because you're not giving them value, because everything's up in the air at the moment. That is what makes things a bit tricky at the moment right now. That's not as much as exchange you can give them right now. They're not even seeing patients. And I, I personally think that it's, it's, it's not the best experience for a pharmacist to have anyway now if you're just doing it over the phone. Because we can just about get used to that patient interaction and now you're telling me that all of a sudden you're expecting me to reach a clinical diagnosis just on the base of the history. And it's not gonna work. You know, how, off, how many ear cases have you seen? An example, how many otitis medias have you seen? Otitis externas have you seen? How many perforations have you seen? How are you gonna feel comfortable with the patient calling up saying, I've got my daughter who's having a discharging ear and could you prescribe some antibiotics? It's happening now. Would you be comfortable doing that? So we've got to think about that, that. How do you get your hands on experience? And I'll give you a solution for that as well as how we can support you as MedLearn, but what you guys can start doing now. So when you next approach the DMP or a surgery, first of all, I want you all to go and check their CQC report. Go on Google, type in CQC, I don't know, London surgery. Find out where they did well, where they struggled. Secondly, go back and have a look at the GMC contract. Find out how they get paid. Find out how their contract works. Then think how you can offer them value. If still after that, you say, I've tried everything for him, it doesn't work, then I'm happy to organize a DMP for you. 
where we will organize a deem fee for you. But I would prefer you to try this first because I don't see why you'd have to pay when you get it for free. So if, if you say, look, Fahim, I've tried everything. And we do have students. I have students all the time who say, Fahim, look, I just can't be bothered with the hassle. Secondly, I've tried everything. It's just not going to work. Right now, because of COVID, it can't happen. That's when we can organize a, a doctor for you. We then teach you. We put you on that journey and so forth. Does anybody have any questions on two things? One is how you're going to go about finding a DMP. And more importantly, folks don't give up. You can't give up. I spent two years knocking, 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 knocking. Doesn't matter. I'm not a loser that I'm going to give up. I'm going to keep knocking on that door until someone's opens the door. I'm going to get in contact with individuals. Ah, uh, Hiba has raised a question. And the question, my dear, is, I'm not sure what the question is. I don't know how I can check what the question is. Uh, answer, dismiss. Hiba, do you want to write it on the chat? Because I'm not, you raised your hand, but I can unmute you, I guess. Let's see if you're happy to talk. Maybe you would be happy to talk and share your question with everyone. Salaam sister, how are you okay? I have now unmuted her. You can talk now if you want, but otherwise you can just write it on the chat. Okay, you can talk. Okay, maybe she can write it on the on the chat. I'm not sure. Did anybody have anybody else have any questions? I'm not sure. Hiba wants to ask a question, but I can't kind of find out. Uh, Azar or Badrul or Chris, Eugenio, Lona, do you folks have any questions? Have I made that clear to you how you're going to go about things now? Everybody's silent. You lot are. You lot are silent, silent, silent crowd. Azar, okay, Azar, thank you very much. Thorin, Thorin's on it. Thorin is always on it. Uh, Hiba, whenever you're feeling, my dear, you can either send me a message or you can write it there. But as it stands, I can't actually, uh, can't actually answer your question. Anyway, moving forward, uh, Hiba can, can catch on. So you have to give something to it. Now, where's the benefits for you in prescribing? Right. Rule number one, whenever you invest in yourself, you can't go wrong. You can invest in a car. You can invest in a house. Things can go wrong. Investing in yourself, nothing's going to go wrong. Okay. Rule number two, you can set up your own private clinic. You could start to work in a GP practice. You could go into aesthetics. You could set up an arrangement with another pharmacy business. You could start doing that. You could uh, potentially start remote prescribing. I wouldn't recommend that at the moment. You could start locuming at higher rates. Plenty of opportunities. I mean, I'll tell you what I've started doing. Okay. Uh, how can we help a DMP? I'm not sure what Eugenio means by that. I'm guessing you're asking how I can organize a DMP for you, maybe. I'll go through that. I'm not sure how we can help a DMP. I'm not sure what your question is, uh, how you can help a DMP. I don't know what that means, but uh, if you write your question a bit clear, that should be fine. But basically, what's the benefit? So you could become a non-medical prescriber today. If you were competent, you could set up your own private clinic. And that doesn't mean that you have to own a pharmacy. You don't have to own a pharmacy or a private clinic. You could start to work in a GP practice and start locuming, go down that route. You could start locuming at higher rates for NHS England, NHS 111. You could start teaching. You could start to diversify to something totally, something totally else. Keeping that aside, the next thing is, you tell me where do you think pharmacy is headed? Do you really feel that if you don't upskill yourself that you're actually going to have a job in five, six years time? Honestly, ask yourself that question. Please, and someone, someone be honest with them, honest with yourselves and write it on there. Tell, come on, Thorin. Do you really feel if you don't invest in yourself now that what do you see yourself doing in five years time? Yeah, ultimately, if the NHS wants more services and you can't offer those services, I'm, I own a pharmacy business. If I had a choice between a prescriber who is clinically orientated, could do a range of conditions versus someone who wasn't, who am I going to go with? Obviously, I'm going to go with somebody who can. Somebody who can't, 
it doesn't i'm already uh, upskilling you can't just rely on dispensing absolutely not you can't just rely on dispensing you need to invest in yourself and then grow your business as well and then you've got leverage now's the time to do it the time isn't once that boat's gone the time isn't when they say okay everyone that non-medical prescribing will be part of the pharmacy program which is happening soon now isn't that's what's going to happen you're behind you've got to be ahead of the curve when you're ahead of the curve that's when you benefit interestingly enough i read an article in the chemist of druggists that spoke about rollins and these institutions actually looking to push for remote supervision do you think it's not going to happen my own take on it is it's probably going to happen i can see how we could probably and it's totally my opinion but i could see how we can have systems in place to manage appropriately and use technology remote supervision is is definitely an option and i think at some point it's going to happen nhs wants uh, cheaper pharmacy so just dispensing i don't agree with that but we're not going to go on to pharmacy discussing that topic today we can do that at some other point i don't think that the nhs wants cheaper pharmacy i think that the nhs wants solutions the nhs is saying that dispensing we can get that done cheaper but can you help us solve this patient who's going to go to the hospital or is going to go to the gp and that costs us 40 pound for a gp appointment a 10 minute appointment or it's going to cost us six seven hundred pound for one nhs bed at night who can solve that problem? If you can solve that problem, you have a contract. That's what the NHS is saying. Okay, look, Fahim, it's now seven o'clock at night. The GPs are not available. He's got an earache. He's going to end up in hospital. When he goes in hospital for a bed, six, seven hundred pounds. For a consultant, you know, for a consultant, two, three, 150, 100, 200 pounds for a consultant appointment when he could have been seen in the community, which was a lot cheaper. This is what the NHS is saying. So if pharmacy can't solve that, They've already got solutions for this. Amazon isn't too far away, folks. Boots haven't just closed 5,000, you know, cut 4,000, 5,000 jobs for no reason. They've already planned exactly where they're taking this model. So the ball's already rolling. We just got to get on top of it. I'm getting all these questions being asked separately. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm working while listening. That's fine, Eugenia, you can work while you're listening. But online is going to be a big thing as well. I do feel that online is going to be big but I feel pharmacists are not ready yet to be able to prescribe, manage and diagnose remotely. Even GPs struggle with it, even clinicians struggle with it. That is a different ball game. You know, we want to do one thing at a time, it's doable, but it's, you've got to get that experience in. So definitely you can in sync yourself with the NHS, you can benefit financially, plenty of things to do. How do you become a non-medical prescriber? So you're a pharmacist and you want to become a non-medical prescriber or independent prescribing, what do you have to do? Step number one, you must be qualified for two years. You must be qualified for two years. Step number two is you need to find a university. Regarding finding a university, folks, my own opinion is, having spoken and taught so many pharmacists from different universities, there's subtle differences in the course, but I've explained to you that the course is not intended to make you a clinician. It's there to give you that legal stamp so you can prescribe. That journey you have to have that's why you're, you're becoming a prescriber because you've got that experience. So irrespective of what university you've gone to, that course, it's not the university's fault, that course is intended for that. That's why they've come up with advanced clinical practice and so forth, is that course is never intended for that. So it doesn't really matter what university you go to, in my opinion, although the particular university that I went to was a, a roller coaster, but I kind of got it at the end what I wanted you know, to get out of it. So it doesn't matter what university you go to, just get in. My advice is to just get in. I spent three years trying to get into Reading University. Just, and then my, my colleagues are like, why do you always want to try Reading University? Because it was local to me. It was cheaper for me. And three years I wasted. I didn't get in and then I went to another university. I thought, you know, I'm sick of this. I need to get in, I've wasted all that time. So essentially, don't waste your time. Apply to a range of universities, just like we did when we went to our UCAS at university. Apply to a range of universities. And then once you get in, pick and choose. But in terms of what they teach, folks are all similar. You're not gonna be having a placement in a GP practice. You're not gonna get all that human dissection, all that experience, they're all very similar. Ultimately, you need to have a plan in place how you are gonna take yourself from A to Z. That is your responsibility. For example, when I wanted to do my non-medical prescribing, one of the other mistakes I made, I never had a clear idea of what I intend to do with it. I knew I wanted to prescribe, but prescribing what? Would you want to become a generalist? 
you want to prescribe for just minor conditions or you know acute conditions i don't like the word minor illness acute conditions do you want to prescribe for chronic conditions do you want to just do aesthetics do you want to branch out me personally i wanted to do everything because the market's in everything i wanted to be able to prescribe diagnose and treat a range of acute conditions blood testing uh uh, you know, eventually finish off my surgical training to, to circumcision, start to do travel, start to do aesthetics, start to do dermatology. I wanted to be the jack, learn everything because I have a passion for it. I love to learn. And I thought I'm going to set myself those targets and do everything. But I would recommend one thing at a time. It says, which is the better field to do IP in? Okay. Which is the better field to do IP in? A very good question. It will depend on what you enjoy. I would always ask you, what do you have an interest in? If it's money you want to make, and you say, I want to make money, there's a shortage of generalists, there isn't a shortage of a diabetic nurse or a diabetic pharmacist, or a, uh, and, I, and I say that crudely, there isn't a shortage of specialists, if that makes sense. Yes, there is, but what the NHS lacks is the generalist. So if you really wanted to develop on a skill, I would recommend a range of acute minor illnesses and dermatology. If you were going to ask me two things that I would say to you that you'll make well and do well financially is minor illnesses and dermatology. The reason I like to say acute conditions of minor illnesses is the problem with aesthetics is, as great as aesthetics is, there's a lot of competition. A lot of competition. Down the street, just in Vista where I am, there's four practices, including myself, who's doing aesthetics. So I'm up against doctors, I'm up against dentists, I'm up against nurses. And also the same thing. What separates me from them is the content that I can put out, the videos that I can make. It's a business, remember. It's how I can market myself better than them. That's what, that's what makes a difference. That's what gets me the trade and doesn't get them the trade. So that's why you have to think about that when you get into aesthetics. Also with aesthetics is there's nothing stopping a beautician from opening next door and for them to slash your prices and people will go for cheap. So you've got to give them value. So I thought, wait a second. A beautician can't treat a range of minor illnesses. Doctors are very, very unlikely going to be sat there and start prescribing for acute conditions. It's far too expensive. Got it. I know where the gap in the market is. Learn your acute conditions. Do your aesthetics. Do your blood testing. Do your, you know, your uh, IV drips and so forth. Everything right there. And that's the route that I went now. And dermatology. Man, I can't tell you how good dermatology is because so many clinicians struggle with it. You, you, uh, you're, you're all pharmacists, right? Tell me something, all of you pharmacists, how many, how, many of your, how many of you are comfortable with dermatology? Or how, first question, how many of you are comfortable with dermatology? Secondly, how many of you have seen a prescription for a steroid, a fungal, and an antibacterial? Uh, Ahad, how many times have you seen that prescription? For a fungal cream, like uh, Caniston, and they've also put an antibiotic in there as well combined. There you go. So my colleague I just said too, just too, it's so common is because even, even primary care clinicians are not comfortable with dermatology. Dermatologists are experts in it, but dermatology seems to be something that's kind of like, oh, this is, this is difficult. And that's where I chose to really spend my time in. It's a huge market for it, purely because the skin being the largest organ of the body plays a huge role how we come across and we all want to look good. So there's a huge market for it. So I would recommend uh, dermatology. I would recommend a group of my, how can we get skilled in dermatology? Uh, I did do a webinar recently on how you can get skilled in dermatology, but essentially gaining competence in any field requires you to have done your, have your theory. So you have your theory, you then get your practical experience where you get to see cases and you then get your training or mentoring or, or mentorship as we call it. Combining those three together is how you get good at dermatology or any condition. And there's a range of courses that we do that can help you in dermatology, aesthetics, minor illnesses, a range of conditions that we offer that we can help treat you. But essentially, the crux of the matter is that for you to become good in anything, that's what you need to do. Uh, Thorin or uh, Sahira or Sana, tell me when you became, if you do drive, tell me what made you competent in driving. Somebody answer that on the chat. Anyone? What made you competent in driving? Thank you. It wasn't your 
It wasn't your doing. It wasn't your uh, exam, was it? Do you remember when we all sat that exam? It wasn't the exam, was it? It was repetition. It was practice. That exam was literally before the exam. You opened it up. You memorized everything and passed that exam. And that exam was nothing like what happens in real life. Think about it. Nothing like what happens in real life. Real life driving is totally different. Same thing with the human body. Alhamdulillah, the way we've been made, the way we've been created, the books can only give you an average depiction. The reality is something totally different. So that's why as much as, uh, uh, yeah, dermatologist could be your DMP, why not? But I wouldn't go with something that specialist. You do know, I'd be careful with going something that specialist because you're really limiting yourself. Start to gain your general skills and then work out from there. So same thing with prescribing. How do you become competent is first of all, you have your theory. You understand the human body. For example, let me give you an example. Let, something you can all relate with. Let's look at, uh, let's look at a titus media. Okay. So acute otitis media is essentially inflammation of the middle ear. And we know that the middle ear connects into the nasopharynx. And we know that those individuals who have a upper respiratory tract infection or sinus infection can trickle its way backwards and you can develop acute otitis media. So that's your knowledge on that side. We know the functions of the ear are balance and hearing. So anything that affects, the, you know, affects, your, affects your ears or, the, or, the, or one of these special organs is going to cause problems with this. So that's your theory where you understand, okay, I understand what the function of the ear is. I understand what the physiology of sound is, how sound works. I also understand the location of the ear because the, the ear is located in the temporal bone, the petrous part of the temporal bone. And its location is such that above you have the brain, bottom you have the uh, carotid arteries and the jugular vein and so forth. So inflammation or infection of this area can spread upwards and downwards. That's your theory. Then you come onto the practical side of what is otitis media. Otitis media is inflammation of the middle ear. What are the signs and symptoms? These people with an earache, these people who have a discharging ear, these people have a bulging tympanic membrane. You know, the certain landmarks that you can't see. You learn that side of the theory then you start to see cases in real life and then you become competent. Ah, that's what a bulging tympanic membrane is. Ah, that's what uh, uh, otitis media looks like. Ah, not every patient has a fever. Oh, that's what mastoid tenderness is. That's how you learn. So you have your theory and that theory is what you build your knowledge on. If you don't have theory, you can't build your knowledge. You're not safe. So you have your theory and you build on that knowledge. That is essentially how you become competent. And you must see patients because if you don't see patients, folks, I'll show you some pictures in a second of some of the, if I get a chance and we're not too busy, of people with discharging years and so forth, is if you don't see patients, you're never gonna know what it actually looks like in reality because the books can only give you an average depiction. And I just had a patient today who, um, you know, we were discussing with, uh, who had shortness of breath. So her history was that she had shortness of breath going on for about, uh, you know, a couple of months, but started to get worse. And she described that when I walk up the stairs, I'm getting even more shortness of breath. On the oxygen sat, she was 95%. She could possibly be having a PE, a pulmonary embolism. Totally fit and healthy. Doesn't have any other risk factors. She recently did have surgery about 10 months ago, but you know, she didn't have a period of immobilization. My point is that without seeing patients, you're never gonna become comfortable. And as a pharmacist, oh, you know how easy it is for you as a pharmacist? Let me give you a secret. Okay, Thorin, or let me pick on Rami. Rami, oh, Rami, Rami's here. Let me pick on uh, Nelly or somebody else. Tell me, when was the last time you folks saw a prescription for Otomize? Or anything to do with the ear? Or amoxicillin. Okay, so Ronick says two hours ago. Okay, when was the last time that you said, okay, madam or sir, do you mind if I can have a look at your ear? Or well, even if you've not been taught how to do that, could you tell me your signs and symptoms to start working backwards? Imagine if you did that with every single case, how much you would learn, even if you weren't taught by anyone. But okay, optimize, you know that much that is use something with the ear. What are your signs and symptoms? Oh, I have a, I have a really painful, sudden onset of pain 
when I touch my ear, it hurts. Ah, okay. And you do that again and again, you'll start to pick things up without taking a risk. Yes, you have to be taught, but there's so much that you can do now to walk backwards. You know, when was the last time you had a prescription for a Pixaban and you actually asked the patient, what's it being used for? Okay, so blood clot, tell me your signs and symptoms. Uh, see how much you can learn. You've got patients right there. And then if you were taught examination skills, what's stopping you from getting the otoscope and having a look inside say, ah, well, that is exactly what an ear infection looks like. Easy. That's what I did. But yeah, the trouble is obviously that, that it takes a long time and you could get from A to B a lot quicker. But essentially, I'm just saying how there's so much opportunities for you to learn. That was my point there. That as a pharmacist with all those patients, you need to ask yourself, when did you last invest in yourself? When did you last educate yourself? So rule number one, you're not going to waste your time focusing on a thousand universities. What you're going to do instead is you're going to apply to all of them because they're all the same, in my opinion, in terms of the course that they offer. Some obviously might be better than others, so forth, but in terms of what they're offering is the same. They're not turning you to doctors. Rule number two, you have a plan in place. What do I intend to do with this? How am I going to get my clinical skills? How am I going to, once you know where you want to be, how am I going to get my clinical skills? What's my plan? I want to set up a private clinic. How do I get there? Am I prepared to put the hard work in? Am I prepared to educate myself? Because prescribing folks is not straightforward. It's not difficult. It requires you to invest in yourself. Uh, Ahad, sorry, I keep calling you here. When you see me practice, what do you see that I like to do? Study. study. Thank you. The first thing is says study. I'm always, I don't have my books here, but if you ask him, he will tell you this guy is always studying. I'm not saying you have to dedicate yourself to studying books. Dedicate yourself to educating yourself and bettering yourself. You can't go wrong in life in anything. Okay? But you must educate yourself. You know, you've got the latest iPhone. I've got the latest sketcher shoes. <laughs> You've got the latest laptop. When did you last invest in this? When did you last educate yourself and invest in this? So have a think about that. Okay, you get a plan in place. Be prepared to learn and be clear that don't expect after six months that you're going to be prescribing Tom, Dick and Harry. It doesn't work like that. But Fahim's doing it. Fahim's invested three years of himself and he works on himself every single day. That's why he's able to do what he does. That's why I'm able to stand in front of a group of 20 or 17 students comfortable talking. I invest in myself, okay? And I have, I'm surrounded by people who push me in the right direction. I don't like to associate myself with negativity. I ain't got time for that. Life is too short. I don't have time for that. If there's negativity in my life, please distance yourself. You know, they say misery loves company. And mate, you're not doing that to me. If you're negative, do your thing. Do not surround yourself with negative people or negative thoughts. I have time for that. I want to make a difference in life. I want to help my parents, my family. I want to help you folks. I've got to be mentally ready for this. I can't be sat here talking to you with a thousand things on my mind. So negative people, tell them or motivate them. If they're dragging you down, tough, out. You can't do that with family and friends. It's a bit difficult. Uh, Develop your scope of practice. What I mean by that is make sure that you have a real clear scope of practice. For example, if you want to treat minor illnesses or a range of acute conditions, you must, must, must be clearly defined. That if I'm gonna treat acute conditions, I'm gonna start with otitis media. What kind of otitis media? Otitis media with infusion, chronic otitis media, or chronic superative otitis media, are you treating mild, moderate, severe otitis externa, dermatitis, infected dermatitis? What do you want to treat? So you want to develop that scope of practice. You also need to know that it requires money. You're looking at about two to three thousand pounds at university, travel time, days off from work at locoming. But I think the moment you start to value your time more than money, life becomes more straight, straightforward. If you're valuing your money more than your time, you've I don't, I, I'm not in sync with that. You know, what you lot have given me today is, you lot have given me the most precious thing that you could have given me today of 45 minutes of your time. You could have paid me 50 quid, 100 quid an hour, it's nothing. This time you could have been spending with your family, you're spending with me. So Alhamdulillah, I'm blessed for that to happen. But you folks have given me something that's valuable. So your time is worth more because when you go in the grave, folks, it's not the money that matters, it's your time it ain't coming back. So remember that. Secondly, exams. There's pharmacology exams, 
as door exams that are OSCEs that they like to test you on. Okay? Right. I'll go through some books I can recommend and we'll go on to how Medlin can help you. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask me before I move on to the next slides? Anything you folks would like to ask me? You can ask me anything, I don't mind. I'll give you guys, I'll give you guys a bit of time to think if you've got any questions. Now's the time to ask, no question is a stupid question. If you're thinking about it, everybody's thinking about it. So uh, anyone, Ronak, Samira, uh, Nelly, Rami, Sana, Thorin, Hiba. So can a pharmacist, can a pharmacist, no medical prescriber be a DMP? No, he can't be a DMP, but he can be a DPP. So I'm just being, I'm just being, uh, I'm just being, uh, being a bit pedantic, but he can become a designated prescribing practitioner, which is essentially a DMP, a designated medical practitioner. Yes, but, 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 if you're gonna go with the pharmacist, please, please, please check what are your credentials? What are you doing yourself? What's your prescribing? You wanna be taught by someone who's doing it day in, day out. You don't just wanna go for the qualification. You're gonna come back to me saying, Fahim, now put me on your courses and teach me. That's what you're gonna do, folks. You're gonna come back to me, gonna say, teach me now, because you've not listened to my advice. If you're gonna to go to a pharmacist or you're gonna to go to any clinician, find out what value are they giving you in return? Can they teach you? Have they taught someone before? Are they doing it in practice themselves? So they can, but be careful. Uh, best consultation model to be used. Right, best consultation model to be used. There isn't a best consultation model. Essentially, you need to have a sound understanding of the patient journey. For example, when a patient walks through your door, your consultation starts right there. When I have a patient who walks through my door, I'm straight away assessing that patient. Is this patient systemically well? Or uh, does this patient look toxic? Is this patient well? How does this patient look? Okay. When I start to give them a pre-assessment, I'm making my judgments. I like to teach my students, if you were to go to a museum and I had asked you to pick out a picture and describe it so well that you could give those descriptions to me and I can find that picture in that museum, you're on the right track. So your observation skills have to be good. So I like to use the Cambridge and Calgary model, but I've just made it into the Medlin model because I've totally changed it. I've made it into what works step by step because those models are there to use as a guide. But as a pharmacist, our learning, our experience is totally different to what doctors and nurses have. So I've developed that model into my model and it works totally differently. Okay, but essentially you have a presenting complaint. You have a history of presenting complaint. You have a social history. But these things are just, these things are just headings. It's the concepts that you need to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why do I need a drug history? Why do I need a medication history? Why do I need to take a history? So yes, you can research the Cambridge and Kegel model if you wanted to. There's other models as well. But ultimately, you've got to do, you must be able to utilize those skills in a format that works for you. Okay, you might want to, the, you know, I started to measure the vitals first. Because if that patient is systemically unwell, or maybe becoming septic, what's the point of me going into the whole history? When if this guy needs to be referred immediately? Just food for thought. Uh, Hiba, I hope I've answered your question. If, it, if I haven't, please do put in a bit more depth what you're looking for. If you want to be an IP in minor illnesses, do you need to do it in minor illnesses or can you choose specific ones? If you want to, if, if you want to be an IP, if you want it to look, as a prescriber, let me get this straight. As a prescriber, you can prescribe in any condition you want, but you have to be competent because when something goes wrong, A, it's not fair on that patient. Secondly, it's your neck on the line. So you'll be registered on the GPAC as independent prescriber, do as you wish. But, right, if I had, for example, let's say I had Hiba and she said, oh, I'm going to start prescribing in uh, diabetes, okay? Talk to me about diabetes then. What is diabetes? What's the pathology? What's the pathophysiology? How does the body respond to diabetes? You know, how are you going to diagnose, manage and treat? If you can't answer these basic questions, this is where you land yourself in trouble. And there are a range of pharmacists who have got themselves in trouble because when they come for an inspection and the GPHC inspect and they ask, okay, you know, you're prescribing minor illnesses. Tell me, how are you prescribing minor illnesses? 
what leg will you have to stand on when it's like, well, actually, I've done my IP qualification, and if they have these, 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 I treat and manage, mate, you're going to get yourself in trouble. It's not good enough. You're prescribing antibiotics, you don't have a clue about antimicrobial stewardship. You're going to get yourself in trouble. You know, I want to prescribe for otitis media. I don't know the three common causes of the bacteria. Haemophilus influenza, non-typable, Maxahala catahills, and streptococcus. If you can't answer this question, why are you treating and prescribing? So you need to be very specific what you want to learn and build on that, okay? Uh, you have to do a set amount of hours with the DMP. Did you go over that? Yes, you have to do a set amount of hours with your DMP. Most universities like a total of 90 hours. That can be split into a minimum of 70%, 30% should be with your DMP. The remaining 70% can be with any clinician. So it works out to, I think when I last checked, well, I think it's some universities say 50%, but when I went to open university, they said 45 hours as a minimum should be done with your DMP. The remaining 45 hours you can do with another prescriber. Okay. Uh, do you recommend doing that? I'm not sure what you meant, Sana, doing what? Which qualification course at university is better, either standard or clinical courses? I would say personally that if you're going to go on a course, you should make sure that course is hands-on practice because the theory is not what you're looking for. And this is why the courses that we've developed fit that gap. All my courses, all our courses are hit this model. You have your theory, you then have your practical and you have patient access. If you've got a course that can give you that and can give you mentoring, then you're on the right track. If you're, if your university are able to give you a mentor where you can pick up the phone and speak with someone, then you're on the right track. I'm not sure what universities can do that. We do offer that because that's what you need to get from A to Z. Or if you're willing to invest three, four years of learning in a GP practice, fair enough. But ultimately we cut that gap and we say, okay, Thorin, you want to become a non-medical prescriber? We will teach you the theory. We will teach you the practical. We will give you access to patients. We will give you mentoring. We will teach you how to make money out of this as well. It's not just about clinical stuff. You can get all the clinical skills in the world if you want. If you can't make money, you can't put food on the plate. What's the point? My own opinion. So we say, okay, Thorin, you want to make money out of this? We teach you how you can turn this into financially. We teach you how to set up a clinic. We teach you how to put into practice. We teach you how to work in a GP practice. We teach you how you could become a partner in a GP practice. I'm not sure if there's many courses that offer that. Uh, so, so there's the clinical side that you need, you need the clinical side. And the clinical side involves a patient journey, involves clinical governance, and involves that from the patient from start to finish, can I do that consultation? As that patient walks into my door, can I do that complete that consultation? Can I do a risk assessment? Can I safely diagnose, treat, and manage a range of conditions? Can I undertake an examination? Am I safe? Am I auditing my practice? Am I regularly doing my reviews? Am I following best practice? Do I have a support network? Because how else do you learn? If you're working all alone and you've never seen cases, how are you gonna learn? So we provide all of that. So we say, okay, Fahim, we're gonna take you from here and get you here. This is the pathway that we take you from start to finish, okay? Uh, it says, how can we help set the RD, ERD for the GP if we don't know their system? Please expand on that. Very good question. If you don't know their system, you need to go and learn that system. Absolutely, you're right. You need to go learn that system. You might want to go to them and say, look, can I spend some time shadowing? Or again, we can help you with practicing on systems and so forth, but essentially you've got to learn the system. That is what needs to be done. It's not that, it's not that difficult. Honestly, within a day, you'll learn the system. It's so straightforward, seriously. And again, if you're struggling with that, I can organize something to help you with that if you need that. Uh, can you do part of the DMP hours with other healthcare professionals, e.g. nurses, pharmacists working in the surgery? Yes, you can. Would you suggest pharmacists study for clinical diploma prior to IP course? I would recommend, I'm not gonna to start to describe courses. I'd suggest you ping me a message privately because some people get offended if I start to give my opinion too much. My own take on clinical diplomas, advanced clinical practice, I have a different take on that. I, I, I have a very different take on that. I have a more practical approach to that. Ultimately, like I've said to you, if you can teach me how I'm going to make money out of this, you're going to teach me how I can help patients, you're going to teach me how I can better my practice, you're going to give me a pathway, and you're going to take me from A to Z. If a clinical diploma does that for you, if advanced clinical practice does that for you, if Medlin does that for you, then I'm interested. If that are my goals, 
If that are not your goals and you want something else, then it's different. So you need to balance what you actually want. Uh, do all GP practices use the same system? No. No, they don't. There's system one, there's emails, there are some differences. And again, you must do your due diligence before you go into work in a GP practice. Otherwise, they're not interested in taking you on because you're a liability. Period. If they're having to, and I'm not being disrespectful, difficult with you, Samir, but I'm just trying to practice that if you are, you have to start somewhere if you don't have these basic skills and you can learn so much on the internet. They're going to think, oh man, do we want to invest in this? Or we can get a nurse or someone else at half the price. This is where the problems happen. Right. Books, okay, pitfalls I've explained to you that if you don't have a support network, you've seen the PDA guidance reached recently where pharmacists have landed themselves in hot water in GP practices because they're treating, managing, and diagnosing without having the right training. They've got themselves in trouble. Make sure you enjoy what you want. Don't ignore dermatology. Make sure you're prepared to take a holistic approach and be prepared to take, you know, diag you know risks. Uh, appropriate risks, not anything stupid. How can Medlin help you? We've got a range of courses. First of all is a Medlin Mastery Program. That is where we take you from A to Z. Where we say, okay, you come under our wing and we will take you from A to Z, the whole thing. We will teach you from the patient journey all the way to the end, the follow-up, how to set up your business, how to market yourself, how to develop your clinical skills, how to develop your financial skills, how you can set up your practice. We teach you that from start to finish, all start to finish. That's our mastery program. It's a six month program. It is not for everyone. We do an assessment. We make sure you're of the right caliber. You're at the right stage of your career because it does require input. It does require you to be committed. The other courses that we offer are the DMP course. If you're saying Fahim, I can't do the Medlin Mastery Program. It's expensive for various reasons. I'd like you to help me find a doctor or a clinician. We can find that for you. We can find a clinician for you. And we can organize that for you when we find a doctor. We have a range of doctors in Birmingham, Oxford, London, Manchester, and so forth. Most of them are pretty booked now, but the new course is starting in September. But if you're still struggling, I can organize that for you. But essentially, uh, we can organize that for you when we find a DMP. You go do your learning, you get your qualification, can be done. That course itself, again, you can find the information on the website. We can do that. We do courses on dermatology. We do courses on minor illnesses. We do courses on organizing your DMP. We do courses on aesthetics. So pretty much anything you wanted can be organized. Right, I've explained that to you, that all our classes are small classes. We like small classes. We actually like to teach. I don't like to, kind of give stuff and not teach. I enjoy teaching and we like to teach. We give you hands-on practice. We give you mentoring and support. So you can pick up the phone and say, Fahim, I've got this patient here. I don't know what to do. We will support you through it. We give you access to all the algorithms for all the conditions that you learn so you have somewhere to start with, similar to a PGD slash clinical management plan. That you've got something in place, so you've got something to start with and you're not just throwing the deep end that now start managing and diagnosing we take you on that journey from start to finish. Access to patient, access to how to benefit financially, algorithms, the whole works is there for you. Right, believe it or not, I've had a great evening. My time is up. <laughs>